You know, some dogs, some dogs never bark when they should, but always when they shouldn't. And if there's too much racket at your house, you and your pupster need a new plan. But yelling and punishments aren't going to cut it. Let's figure out why it's happening and manage that. Have you had a problem like that at your house? You know, it just, you can't control it. Neighbors complain. Uh, there can be a variety of reasons why different dogs will bark excessively. And you don't treat them all the same way. But there's a, there are good ways of managing this and good ways of figuring it out. By the way, in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm residency trained in veterinary behavior medicine with a whole long career preceding that in general practice. So if you have a question about cats or dogs, behavior, any other physical issues, put them in the comment line. I'll be happy to share information with you and see if I can give you a hand. Um, and by the way, if you can hear me loud and clear, please hit the wow button just so that I know my microphone's working. And if this is helpful information, send me some hearts just so that I know I'm being useful. And by the way, this is Miss America, the Nickel Family Border Collie. And this is Tony and Gaston. They're, they're enjoying these indoor hunting feeders, which um, they're sort of addicted to this stuff, but it keeps them occupied, you know? Oh, thank you for the hearts. I, thank you for telling me I'm doing something helpful. So I'd like to start with reading you a question I got from my newspaper column. I write this every week in the Albuquerque Journal. Most of my questions come to me through um, my Facebook page, so you're welcome to send me questions there if you like. Um, and this has to do with barking, barking at neighbors in particular. Our Australian Shepherd named Maverick and our West Highland White Terrier, Jenny, have a big barking problem if anybody walks by our house or, heaven forbid, comes to the door. Probably a little bit of territorial behavior in there, amongst other causes. Here, buddy. Um, well, Maverick charges at them if they're near the wall. And we've tried a shock collar, a spray collar, noisemaker, treats, water spraying, time out, affirmation, and loving. That's probably the best one. Nothing's working. And my neighbors hate us and have even called animal control. Now, that's a problem. You know, neighbor relations really matter, and uh, you don't want to start getting citations because, uh, you know, you end up in court. And, uh, oh, Cindy, thank you for coming. Great to see you. Uh, you can end up in court, and this, these whole things can get ugly, and um, you can get increasingly frustrated. And you really do need to do something about this stuff. But again, it's, it's about the cause. Barking is a symptom, and by the way, let's, let's be frank, Dogs are supposed to bark. It's a normal behavior, but excessive barking, that's a problem. So here was my answer. You live next door to me, don't you? I'm glad you wrote considering we're not speaking anyway. Oh, actually, you're not my neighbor, thankfully, but I'll help you anyway. I try to add a little humor to these things, make them interesting. Despite millennia of domestication, our dogs retain their innate need for choice in social interactions. Escape or avoid, posture or engage. They've got normal canine behaviors they need to engage in. And uh, when we get in the way of that, they can get frustrated and anxious and act out in unhealthy ways. Fences are necessary, but the canine brain is completely flummoxed by them. Maverick needs to confront those aliens who pass his territory, but that blasted wall is driving him crazy. He has barrier frustration. You and I understand things like walls around our yards and fences and windows and leashes. But you know, the truth is our dogs don't have any innate concept of those. But if you have a, a well-adjusted dog who's adaptable to different situations, they just go along with you, even though they don't really understand. But if you've got a dog who really gets agitated, and it may be the only time they behave in an unhealthy way, or it could be an indicator of anxiety in lots of contexts, um, well, we need to do something about it because it only gets worse. Prevented from functioning like a real dog, he wigs out. Jenny is following her leader. Barking seldom improves with punishment because it's part of normal canine communication. When you're away, your dog should have gainful employment. Ideally, an innate behavior that will occupy their attention 
indoors, foraging for their survival, foraging for their survival, much as they would in the wild, could be perfect. Replace Mavericks and Jenny's food bowls with food dispensing toys and puzzles. Your dogs will focus with intensity on the primal art of survival by extracting their sun sustenance. <laughs> Tongue tied. And I, I know that if you've been to my Facebook lives before, you see me talk about this particular food toy. There are lots of them. The best ones for your dogs are the ones that they like. But I like this thing called the twist and treat because you can put food inside it. Canned food I, I like. In fact, I, I tend to put canned food in it and then stick it in a Ziploc and freeze it overnight. And then you can adjust how challenging it is for the dog by how close you screw the two halves together. It's got this funky shape, so it's a little challenging for the dog to manage. There's lots of different kinds of food toys, and in many cases, I suggest that people get rid of the food bowl and provide all of their dog's sustenance in food toys and puzzles. And by the way, many dog food toys are perfectly good for cats, and they have food toys for cats. But you know, whatever works for them is what you want to use. But you need to keep them not just occupied, but focused on something that's much like what they would do in the wild, which is, you know, finding something dead to eat. And cats will work on these things too. Um, and they get, it takes a lot of uh, not only mental focus for them to figure these things out, <clears throat> but they also have to use their muscles and they can get good and tired. It's pretty decent exercise. So food toys are, are worthwhile as a way of, of keeping the dog focused instead of it just reacting to every darn little thing. Um, your dogs, um, okay, a G whiz gizmo called the Pet Tutor, I don't have one of those to show you, uses food to reinforce quiet. And in fact, these are pretty cool because like many things, it has a smartphone app. And when you're not at home, um, you can push the button on your smartphone and release a treat from the Pet Tutor that reinforces the pet for doing the right thing. Uh, the iFetch is another gizmo, and that's pretty cool. That's I-F-E-T-C-H, and it's a device that can be used indoors or outdoors, and so can the uh, Pet Tutor, by the way, because it shoots treats out. Um, the iFetch, though, has, has balls that the dog picks up the ball and drops it in the top of the thing, and at different time intervals, this thing shoots the ball out, and in different directions, at different trajectories, and um, the dog will go and grab the ball, put it in the top, and then wait, Watch that I fetch device and out comes the ball. And these dogs, again, get good exercise. They're doing things that are natural for them and, uh, and they're less prone to reactive barking. Um, so uh, the, if those, those, who, those dogs whose head explode with the arrival of visitors can be redirected with a treat and train. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. It's a really excellent device. If more help is needed, uh, you can contact my office. So, um, you know, and, and very well, there may be more help needed. So, just give you some idea on this thing. What I find in my behavior practice often is dogs who are easily startled. And that's usually an anxiety-driven behavior, and I'll give you a really great treatment method for that. Um, but if your dog just, you know, quick movements of the folks in your home, or little household noises, or neighborhood noises that you wouldn't even notice, but your dog is really reactive to them, then those are the kinds of things that some dogs will react to and bark and bark and bark um, because they're startled. Um, and that's not healthy either. Um, we also recognize something called trigger stacking. In other words, you've got one unhealthy arousal trigger, like a noise, and then you add something else to that, like maybe territorial behavior for dogs who bark like crazy when somebody walks into the house, when a visitor arrives, or when somebody walks past the house. But then if the dog has also got some chronic pain, and you don't necessarily have to, thank you for the heart, you don't necessarily have to be an older, elderly dog to have painful jo joints, although many of them do, but some younger dogs do, and a more challenging pain to recognize sometimes is dogs or cats who have intestinal or stomach pain because they are, thank you, Carolyn, more well-loaded indoor hunting feeders to attract cats, to the just for comic relief, of course. Um, but some dogs have chronic nausea um, or esophageal reflux that is not necessarily manifest with vomiting. Um, 
And that kind of frequent or continual discomfort can certainly add to the trigger of, you know, fear of unfamiliar people or uh, territorial uh, reactions um, or anxiety and just make the dog more reactive because there's more than one thing going on and these things stack on top of each other. So we, we're trying to look for every cause when we recognize behavioral symptoms. We say, okay, what is causing it? And with excessive barking can be anything and we diagnose and treat those other problems. And you know, the brain is not all by itself in this world. Other organ systems in the body, whether it's joint pain, GI pain, many dogs are itchy and that can be a continual source of discomfort and that can add to their reactive barking as well. So we, look, we try to find everything on a physical exam. So if you have a dog who reacts to um, visitors uh, or people walking past the house, again, it's so easy to get frustrated, understandably, and you know, yell at the dog or punish. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about anti-bark collars. Uh, when they aren't appropriate and occasionally when they are. Um, but here's a device that um, was developed by uh, my colleague Sophia Yin, who's not with us anymore. This thing you can see, I'll turn it around so you can see it a little bit better. Um, it goes by this one, is an older model, and it says, Ooh, there we go, Manners Minder, but its name has been changed to the Treat and Train, and um, but they look the same. And it's a pretty nifty device with a little one button remote control gizmo. And the way this thing works is this you leave in the same place on your floor all the time. Shouldn't be real close to the front door. I suggest sometimes putting it around a corner. And then in front of it, you put a little a, a, a rug, you know, like one of these inexpensive bathroom rugs with the rubber underneath so it does not slide around. And they always stay in the same place so that what your dog learns to do, and it comes with a really uh, well done uh, DVD for instruction and a booklet, and it's not hard to teach a dog that when they hear the doorbell, or when they hear a knock at the door, or when they hear a verbal command, which you could use anything as long as it's always the same, most people use the word place, um, so the dog hears one of those three things, the doorbell, a knock, or the verbal command place, and the dog runs to the mat in front of the treat and train device and lays down, and as soon as their elbows are on the floor, you push the remote button, here it is, and this thing beeps and dispenses a treat. Well, dogs are going to eat that treat, aren't they? Well, this thing causes the area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens to activate, which works best with variable interval reinforcement. In other words, different time intervals. Sort of like when you play a slot machine. You never know when it's going to pay off, but you know at some point it will. So when you hear somebody at the door, when the doorbell rings, the dog's already been trained. They hear that sound, they run and lay down in front of this, and you keep the, the little remote button someplace handy or even in your pocket. So you check, and as soon as your dog's lying down completely, you push the button, this thing beeps and spits out a treat. And then you talk to the visitor or you invite them in, and at varying time intervals, you push the button and dispense another treat. So the dog remains camped out in front of it on that mat. It's very consistent, and the dog gets, gets a treat at random time intervals. Well, the other beauty of this thing is that if your dog is just, you know, somebody's walking past the house, and the dog runs to the window and barks, um, you can give the dog the place command, and if it's, your dog is well trained to it, they run over, camp out in front of the treat and train. Of course, you have the button handy. You push the button, and the dog gets a treat until they go the other way. So this thing is a very, very cool device, and any dog can be trained to it. Um, you know, some people have dogs that, you know, the UPS delivery person comes to the door, for example, and the dogs are flinging themselves at the door, and you can't hardly open the door to accept a package or something. This thing here works like a charm. So I would strongly recommend it. It takes a little bit of training, but most dogs can be trained in one week, and it's a skill that will last a lifetime for them. So that's a pretty good device. Um, but you know, you don't have to do that. You can with dogs who bark at passers-by. They're not highly agitated. You can have a verbal, or what they call a key phrase, where, or just a word, where you teach your dog that it will get reinforced if it stops barking even a split second. 
So if you say to your dog, you say, Miss America, watch me, and she knows that one, then if you have the clicker in your hand, you say, Miss America, watch me. And then, of course, she knows that that will be followed by a treat. Okay. Um, this thing will interrupt the behavior. And then you can give another command, like sit or down or come. And when the dog does it, again, reinforce with a clicker and give another treat. And clicker training is not hard to do at all. Um, and you can go to my website, drjeffnickel.com, D-R-Jeff, N-I-C-H-O-L. And, and it's searchable, and you can put clicker in there, and you'll find information that I have about clicker training. There's a lot of other sources for it on the web, um, but it's an immediate reinforcer because your thumb's right there on the button. So th the only argument that I have with these approaches is that you've got to be on duty, and uh, you know, you've got to be quick. You have to be equipped. I recommend carrying a treat bag, so you always have treats available. Always have the, uh, the clicker in your pocket or handy or the one button remote control for the, um, you know, the treat and train. You, know, you have to be on duty. And if this kind of stuff happens when you're gone uh, and your neighbors are complaining and you're not there to interrupt your dog, uh, you don't have much yet. So let's, whoops, what the heck happened? So anyway, it's all right, little guy. Um, did anybody here have a dog who reacts to guests where they're just really struggling with it? Put it in the comment line and I'll see if I can address it for you. Um, so I'll tell you, the, the other thing that really is helpful with setting a dog up for being responsive to this stuff is what we call earned privileges, sometimes called nothing in life is free. Well, there are two things a dog can have without asking, mother, may I? And that's air to breathe and water to drink. But if they're going to eat, if they're going to go out, come in, go for a walk, get a kind word, a pet in the head, well, dogs are genetically programmed to look to their leader for opportunities to earn resources. And for them, everything but air and water is a resource. They do not believe, as, I mean, we believe they're entitled to our love and our affection, but they don't see it like that. So if you're going to be an effective canine leader, you need to understand that dogs see thumbs, some things quite differently. So if you want your dog to Keep its eye on you as it should to watch and wait and hope for opportunities to earn all those excellent things. And you can provide all the interaction, all the petting, affection, love, all of that that you want. But it's ideal if your dog believes that she has to earn every bit of it because they think that way anyway. So if you want to interact with your dog and you invite him over and give him a simple command like sit her down and he does that, that's when you start the petting and the affection and all that stuff. And the same would be for, you know, being allowed to eat, require him to sit, put the food bowl down, hold the leash, don't let him go, wait, and then you give him a simple release command like, okay, and he gets to eat. So what he learns is that he can have everything that he needs and a whole lot of it, but he has to earn every bit of it. And that gives a dog a canine specific structure that can really bring stability. If your dog's got that kind of a structure going, then it's a lot easier when you want to get their attention when they're barking that you can click, for example, get the dog to look at you or use a keyword like watch me and the dog earns an opportunity then and you give it another command and it gets food and praise. So you've got to be on this thing. Uh, you know, it's, again, it's kind of hands on. Now, what many people like to do is make this thing much faster and simpler. Well, I certainly get that. And so anti-bark collars, well, there's a lot of those going on. Let me show you a picture of one. This is, uh, this is in a behavior textbook, and it is a punisher. And that, the reason is that it's an aversive. In other words, the dog doesn't like it. This is not an electric shock collar, but instead a citronella anti-bark collar. And uh, it does not cause pain, and it looks like this. Of course, that dog looks mighty happy to get to getting this blast of this citronella spray from this collar under its chin. Um, somehow, I think it was photoshopped. But anyway, oh, I have a question. I'll get to that, Diane, in just a minute. So um, here's the thing. Punishment is not a four-letter word in learning theory. It certainly has a legitimate place because if it is instituted immediately following the undesirable behavior, every single time, 
strong enough to make a difference, and consistent in the strength of the punisher, um, it can reduce the frequency of an undesirable behavior. Well, a citronella bark collar can do that because, you know, it works whether you're there or not. The problem with using like a shaker can, you know, people put pennies in a can and put duct tape on the top and the dog starts to bark and they throw the thing, or water sprays, um, or verbal reprimands, um, is that those punishers come from the leader, the person your dog is supposed to trust and, and take his security from, from you. And you, you could be damaging a relationship. And of course, if you've done much of this punishing for barking, um, and you still have the problem, we already know it's not working very well. But an all the time on duty punisher like a citronella anti-bark collar, it can get the job done. But you have to remember that whatever the punisher, even if it's a very effective one, there's never anything about it that teaches the dog what to do instead of the punished behavior. In other words, they have a motivation to bark excessively, for example, and we've punished the, the manifestation the symptom, if you will, but what about the cause? So if we punish that barking every single time and the dog learns to stop barking, well, if they're anxious, if they're fearful, if they're just overwhelmed with territorial behavior, if they're doing it because they have separation anxiety or some other manifestation of anxiety and all we're doing is punishing the behavior, they can get a lot more anxious. So I'm not a real big believer in punishers. Um, it just doesn't help us very much and of course, Electric shock collars, they can do the job too, but now we've, we've got a kindness problem then, don't we? And I don't know about you, but doing things that are harsh and painful to my dog, I'm not really where I want to go with this stuff. And I have this question here from Diane. See if I can get my iPad to work. Okay, thank you. Not barking, but my greyhound literally hugs guests. We love it and don't want to eliminate our hugs when we uh, come home. But some guests hate it. Can we train him to only hug sometimes? Well, actually, you can, Diane. Um, <clears throat> greyhounds are a very interesting breed, aren't they? Um, you know, we, we tend to lump sighthounds together like, you know, Italian greyhounds and Salukis. And, uh, oh, I've got low battery. Sorry about that. So I better not go on forever tonight. And um, now it's dim because the battery ran down. Anyway, <laughs> what you can do is leave a leash on your greyhound all the time, especially when you have guests. And when the dog jumps on somebody who's just not going to like it, you step on the drag line, this leash that the dog drags around, so that there's no way that the dog can get off the ground. Um, and then when you have a guest who might enjoy that sort of contact with your greyhound, then you can um, let go of the leash and you can use a command, something like hug. And if you say that word as your dog is doing it, that's called capturing a behavior. And the dog can learn that when I do this, I hear that command, and the dog earns a pet from this other person who, who likes it, and that's the reinforcer. Um, so your dog can learn that, well, when I don't hear that command, I'm not gonna be doing it. But you're not punishing, you're preventing, you're avoiding the problem by holding onto that leash. And sometimes the easiest way of doing that is to clip the handle of a regular six foot leash into a, you know, these lightweight carabiners that people use on their belt to hang keys, that kind of stuff. Well, you can clip the handle of a six foot leash into that. So, you know, whether you stand on it or not, you're, you have control of it. But what you don't want to do when your dog tries to hug somebody who doesn't really want it is don't reprimand and, and you want to, and so does your guest. Because your dog will regard any response from its leader as a validation of its behavior and of its emotional state of the moment. So if your dog is doing something you don't want, you do not reprimand. It's hard not to do that, but you absolutely remain silent. But you can use that leash, which the dog does not innately understand, and prevent the behavior, and then again, capture it with a word like hug when you want the dog to do it. And as I am fond of saying, repeat hundreds of times. One last point here before my battery completely dies, as I wanted to point out the Comer K9 device. This is FDA approved for treatment of separation anxiety, but we have lots of anecdotal evidence and experience, and my practice included, in using it on dogs who have lots of different manifestations of anxiety, including when it results in excessive barking. And it's this halo-shaped gizmo here. You push the button and 
it, it flashes for 15 minutes and you put this on the dog. I've got this little vest on Miss America. It's got a little Velcro patch right behind her head. Here, girlfriend, can you sit up so people can see that? You see this thing on her? Well, it sits right behind her head and it targets the amygdala, the fear and anxiety center of the brain. And two 15-minute sessions a day, morning and evening, there is no sensation from it and it's completely safe. You don't need a prescription. So if your dog has an anxiety problem, whether it's separation anxiety or she is reactive to noises and passers-by and you want to dial back that anxiety, you simply go to Calmer Canine, that's C-A-L-M-E-R, the word Calmer, the letter K, the number 9.com, CalmerK9.com, and you can order this thing, and you can get this little vest, I don't know if you can see it on her, but it sticks on this little Velcro thing on her neck and around her chest. Um, and so she can just sit with you morning and evening when you're having your coffee and your breakfast in the morning and you're reading or watching TV in the evening, and it's twice a day. It takes about four to six weeks in most cases, but you really don't have to do anything but have this thing sitting on your dog. You don't need prescription medication for it to help, although in severe cases we'll use both. I mean, there's a great deal that we can do. Um, and of course there are other things that can cause excessive barking like Elderly dogs with dementia can do it. Um, but I don't ever like to overlook the possibility of pain. Whew. So, you know, I guess in, in closing, I would say never hesitate to take the time to build a foundation of trust with your dog. Because when we try to get them to do things that are just for us, like reprimanding them every darn time they do something that's actually pretty natural, like barking, we, um, we damage the relationship. And they can get obstinate. They can butt heads with us because they don't understand what we want. And so finding the cause, and that's why a, a good behavior practitioner sometimes can be the only way to get, get through to what really is going to make a difference for you. But they can learn any time, any time in their life, that their relationship with their leader is trust-based, and they can get their needs met, and then they can earn all the great things we're here to provide them by doing what we want. Um, and that to me is what's really rewarding about having a pet because she looks to me, she knows I'm her leader and she can get her, uh, her needs met. And, uh, you know, we just get more tightly bonded the longer we've been together and we've got 13 years going now. <laughs> so anyway, any other questions, you're welcome to put them on my Facebook page. And if you want to get my weekly media blog, which is my newspaper column from the previous week's Albuquerque Journal, and my Facebook Live videos, you can go to my website, drjeffnickel.com, N-I-C-H-O-L, and at the bottom of the homepage, you can subscribe. It's no charge. And when you do, I'll send you my free at-home pet first aid and CPR guide. Um, and you might find that pretty handy. So I, uh, I'm just trying my best to bring out the best in pets and their people. And uh, thanks for sharing some time with me. And uh, with Miss America and Tony and Gaston, who are on the floor because they finished all the cat food out of the little indoor hunting feeders. Um, so thanks again for being here, and uh, have a great weekend. I'll see you next Thursday, and don't forget to wear your mask. And thank you for those hearts. <laughs>